I don't want to take any time away from Elaine Hanzak because I know that her session is going to be really important and really interesting. She's going to be talking, the title is, says it all I think, another twinkle in the eye, contemplating another pregnancy after perinatal mental illness. She also has a few copies of her book that she wrote, which should be available outside a little bit later at tea time. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Elaine. Thank you. Good afternoon. If you've had a chance to look on social media today, I'm sure you'll be aware that it's named Time to Change Day for us all to talk about mental health. So I reckon I've got a great audience here, so thank you for that. It's great on the one hand, and yet quite sad on the other in our society that we have to designate a certain day to talk about mental health. To me, if we want the holistic approach, we should be talking about it every day. And that's what I attempt to do as much as I can. I'm not s suggesting that you all need to be psychiatric nurses as well as everything else that you do. What I am hoping to achieve in this, in this short space of time is to give you the confidence, the interest, and the awareness that within your own roles, you can actually make a very positive and great difference to people's mental health, including your own. There are certain times in our lives when our mental health is very vulnerable. And believe me, and the mums in the room, the perinatal period, you'll know, is certainly one of those that's up there with gold stars on it for, for mental health problems. Um, now, I'd like to share with you today some of my thoughts and information around what do we do if someone who has already had a child and didn't have particularly the, the roses round the door impression of it in reality, what do you do again? Now, for those of you who are in the room who are not already mums, please do not let this next montage be the biggest contraception ever, okay? Because regardless of what happened to me, I dearly would have loved another child, and that's part of the story. So imagine if the first time that you were pregnant, maybe you'd had problems conceiving. Maybe it wasn't all wonderful. Maybe like me, at seven eight, and eight months pregnancy, pregnancy, you were rushed in hospital for water infections. Maybe if the birth, like mine, wasn't actually the pan pipes playing, the incense burning, this baby just gliding out, and your husband scooping you in his arms and saying, oh, Elaine, what a wonder of nature we've produced. <laughs> I need to read different books, don't I? What if your birth you nearly lost your own life and that of your baby. Like me, had postpartum hemorrhage and retained placenta. What if the next day you're told, think yourself lucky, had it been a home birth, you'd be dead now? What if your new baby hasn't read the same books as you? His version of a good night's sleep is two hours at a time. What if by the time he's seven months old, you're suffering like I did from purple psychosis? won't walk about in my nighty, and my life could have ended that night. What if the baby didn't survive? Or what if, like me, yeah, in the days when there were black and white photographs, you were what, you know, as my mum put it to me, had you been the first child, Elaine, you'd have been the only child. My big brother, apparently, was the model baby. I came along... I moaned, I screamed, I demanded attention, apart from apparently there was a man in the room, in which case I changed completely, and my mum says, 52 years on, I've never changed. <laughs> what about if feeding wasn't all that you expected to be? What if you did actually at some point feel like you had piranhas on your nipples with breastfeeding and mastitis? What if it wasn't all that you wanted it to be? What about your siblings? There's my brother and sister and I with our little sister. What would you do with them next time round? And ultimately relationships. My marriage didn't survive. So many relationships didn't. And that's, that's my little sister on her wedding day. The family, the whole relationships, next time round potentially are a challenge. 
do you do it again? By the way, I am on ropes there, taking that leap. <laughs> what can you do about it? And most importantly as well, what if you're pushed and you're unexpectedly pregnant? What do you do? I'd like to share with you now the absolute global superstar that is the philosopher of Rafiki. For those of you who can't quite see the screen there, he says, oh yes, the past can hurt, but the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. And that's what we want to help the mums and the dads out there with. One way I dealt with it was to write. My first book, My Eyes Without Sparkle, came out now in 2005. And I wanted to share my story to show how someone apparently like me who felt she had it all and was going to be this wonderful mother turned out to have quite a tricky journey. I'm actually now very humbled to say I know there are at least five women still alive because they've told me my story kept them going when they felt there was no light at the end of the tunnel. I've spent the last 11 years having the privilege and honour to be at um, events like today, and I've learnt a lot. People have shared their stories with me, and in doing so, one question that came up time and time again was, what do you do next time round? So I've spent the last three years really helping people to find answers to that. I did some research, I've got other professionals involved, and most importantly, I surveyed a lot of families and said, what worked for you? What do you need? What would help? So I would like to share with you some of the things that um, other families tell me really help them. First and foremost is our communication and our mindset. What we speak can have massive impact and implications on people. Look at that T-shirt. That man's t-shirt actually says, wet paint, do not touch. What do you want to do? Eh? How often do we say, don't spill the drink? Eh? Don't touch wet paint. Be careful, the plate's hot. Don't touch it. We always respond to a don't command by doing what we don't want them to do. So you say to somebody, oh, don't panic, don't worry. What they're going to do first, panic and worry. Oh, there's not a problem. I didn't know there was. Or after my sister had a baby, she was told, um, oh, you know, you're not out of the woods yet. And my sister said, I didn't know I was in the woods. <laughs> so when you actually want someone to do something, ask them what, or tell them what you want them to do, not the opposite. My family think that the old school teacher in me is very strict with my niece. I'm not. I simply will say to her, Sophie, hold the cup with two hands. Sophie, keep your knife and fork on the, on the, on the side um, until your plate cools down. So when you're dealing with the mums, you know, don't panic, don't worry. Keep calm. It's okay. We're going to sort this out for you. Yes, I understand you're worried about next time round. Let's do what we can to help sort it. In the same way, look at this sign. It's the explanation. Why do you want someone to take their shoes off? If you're a bit like me, see the sign, take your shoes off. Phew, you must be joking. The explanation, we'd really appreciate you taking your shoes off because small hands are on this, on this floor. It makes us all far more um, amenable. So when you need someone to do something, maybe I use the expression, I need you to, whatever it is, because, give a reason. And that can really help in the birth situation, planning another pregnancy, what can you actually do? Think in, t in positive terms. Listening as well is what so many families tell me is so important. And if you have that positive mindset with them, that okay, last time with, was challenging, no one can set it in sl slate what's going to go, wrong, go right this next time. Let's see what we can do, though. Think in terms of the positive. One thing I would encourage you all to be more aware of is where to get more information on maternal mental health. Find out what you need to know. All of these places, Lancet, um, Maternal Mental Health Alliance, Marseille Society, Action on per per 
postpartum psychosis and Chime out there are all excellent sources of information for you. And I have done a handout which will go with this today um, to give you all the proper links on this. APP particularly is very, very useful if you haven't heard of purple psychosis or there's so much information there for both you as professionals and for the families in your care. And incidentally, I don't know if, any, if we're any EastEnders fans in the room. Um, at the moment, the storyline that they've got on purple psychosis, they have actually consulted APP and some ladies who've actually suffered themselves, which is great. So find out about the different conditions. And then make a plan. I actually confess I would have loved to have been a nurse or a midwife, but once you got rid of that uniform, lost all interest. Um, yep, find out what happened last time. Who were the professionals involved? Was there a psychiatrist involved? In which case, go back to them. See if there's any preconceptual counselling that can be done. What can be done in your locality for preconceptual counselling? And the NICE guidelines CG192, you will find all of the recommended treatments there as well. Just have those tools at hand to find out what people can help, what you can help with. Once people have uh, become pregnant again, help them with what can make it happier and healthier the next time round. Possibly with a second pregnancy, they might be more relaxed. I mean, I like to think I would have been next time round. I think I lived by the Dorling Kindersley Guide and the, the tick lists of what should be happening in week 22. And maybe next time round, I may well have relaxed more and enjoyed it. Ask the mums, what can you do to help them to support them through that stage and make it a better experience? If there's one thing you take away with you today, I would love it to be this. A very straight, one slight change of word. So many women who went on to have postnatal depression told me that their birth experience, they, they felt contributed to it in the fact they'd had a birth plan which didn't go to plan. So I strongly suggest, I, a midwife told me Debbie Gould shared this with me, she said if we use a birth library, it gives that implication we can choose this, this, this and this. And whatever the outcome, it's okay. Whereas a plan impi implies failure. So maybe that's an idea for you to take away with you. Also, you can find lots of examples of other ladies' birth experiences on the Better Birth of Royal, Royal College of Midwives. And Matt Exp as well will also give you lots of stories of what women have found have been really, really helpful. A couple of other areas that maybe you can help support with is bonding. This is my little niece called Sophie. She should have been called Joy because she is to us all. I might not have been a mum again, but certainly being an auntie is great. And I know all the words to Frozen as well, which is good. But bonding next time round. Help work with the mum as she's pregnant and the rest of the family with lots of the bonding things that you can do. One area as well that causes stress for lots of women is around feeding. I loved breastfeeding and I, to this day I feel it was stolen from me because I has, had to be hospitalised in a general psychiatric ward and I, I feel, still feel that loss. Next time round, maybe if there had been, maybe bottle feeding would have been better. I share this photograph of Kelly and her newborn with permission. She had a really tough time with her first baby. And there were lots and lots of conversations and discussions and the agreement was when she had a new baby, it would be straight on formula. Look at that photo for attachment for a mum who first time round had no bond whatsoever. We have to decide what's best individually for that mum and support her. I also feel as well, for me, certainly sleep was very, very um, a tricky area. As someone said, it's not surprising my son didn't sleep with that amount of stimulation in his cot. <laughs> uh, but again, find out what are the ways that you can encourage mums to rest. And really, I wish someone had been cruel to be kind and told me first time around, Elaine, it doesn't matter if his socks don't match his vest. It doesn't matter if the cushions aren't straight. Before you know it, he'll actually be up and off as he now is to uni. Um, that picture reminds me, if you can see the blue thing behind him, he's actually my nighty. As he got older, I'd find him with his head in the laundry basket doing this. I said, what are you looking for? One of your dirty nighties, it smells of you. 
the senses are so important. And I, uh, one mum said to me, Elaine, I've got this new baby, toddler worships the new baby and won't go to bed without him. So I said, when you undress the baby at night, put baby's clothes on toddler's teddy, put toddler's teddy in toddler's bed, work to treat. Think in terms of sensory things to help mums and babies and families to sleep. That brings me on to, to siblings. This again photo was shared by a mum who has gone on successfully to have another baby. And I just love that touching of the fingers. Help work out with them what can be done with the sibling, depending on the age. What if they do have to go in hospital again? What childcare can be set up? Minimise as many things as you can practically to get things sorted. So many families shared with me that if they had a plan, they didn't need it. So far better to put some of these safety nets in place so that you can minimise that anxiousness during pregnancy and beyond. Also, the partner and the family. This was me with my mum and dad and, and grandparents. Mental illness affects the whole family. It really does. The partner could well have been traumatised during the birth as well. It could be a different partner. Um, there's the whole situation, it's a team effort, it really is, and involve them if where you can to get their support. Also, practically, you know, you can get children helping from an early age to hang washing up, you really can. Find out as well what can be done. It might be that your area has the charity Home Start, which you can see if they can go in and help in those early days. But practically as well, minimise, chip off these things that potentially could be stresses and strain. Also, peer support. Again, with the growth of social media, there is a, a much bigger army now, I'd like to say, a sisterhood of us who've been there. Um, and these four ladies all came to my book launch in September, and we're now all very close friends because we all had purple psychosis, and we're proud of it. We, we can get better. I highly recommend on a Wednesday night between 8 and 9, um, Rosie, who is up in the Outer Hebrides, has had antenatal and postnatal depression three times, felt so isolated, and she now has set up this hour every week, um, and she's going to strength to strength with that. She has professionals joining in as well. And also minimise mum's isolation. For example, sites like Mummy Social are there literally just to connect mums so that they don't feel it's just them. There's a whole range of self-help things that you can actually use for your own mental health, but also helping support mums and dads with their young families. There's the five ways to well-being, including connecting, being active, giving and taking notice. Of course, the usual pregnancy and birth things for good health, not smoking, healthy eating. Some mums are finding hypnotherapy can actually be quite useful. Others, um, there's some research out about emotional freedom techniques, tapping. Have a look at some of the different things out there. And also, massage can help, and also apparently pets. So there we go, a dog having a massage, what more do you want? So all of these things, again, can be used almost as a library to pick and choose. There isn't the one, one thing that is the answer for everything, but might be of use. Also, creativity can be really, really useful for mums. When I was researching for my second book, I found some fascinating stuff that was written about Victorian asylums. And apparently back then, women who had, were suffering from um, postnatal depression or psychosis. Knitting was actually one of the um, things they recommended. I knit. This is part of my latest Barbie range. Um, but also, I know some of the support groups, for example, here in London, Cocoon Family Support do um, walks with their mums and also photography. And I think this was beautiful, that one mum who had been very much struggled to explain how she was feeling saw this um, and said, that's like me. It's all pretty on the outside and pink. And inside, there's this blackness, this darkness. So creativity can really help mums to express themselves. 
And that reminds me, Pink, there's one trust that told me that when they have a lady who potentially is in this situation of having a second pregnancy or additional pregnancy after problems before, they'd literally put a little pink sticker on their records just to denote a little bit of extra TLC here um, and to be aware of it. So I'd like to finish just with a few points that maybe personally as well that I would encourage you with, with people. One is being honest. Yes, there is a greater risk that if you've suffered ante antenatally or postnatal anxiety or depression before, you may, do it, may have it again, and there are things that you can help. Leave the butt out. If you can't say it, leave the butt, replace it with an and is far more helpful. What's your attitude? Increasingly, it's great that people aren't just thinking like I used to, oh, mental illness, she's pathetic, she should write a list and she'd be fine. No, what's your attitude to mental health? It really is something we all can make a difference with. Ask the mum and their families what are their actual needs? Will it be about the siblings? Will it be about feeding? What is it? And then help answer those questions. Zest. You know, you even can smile when you're depressed. That's allowed, and that took me a long time to actually realize that even if mentally you are suffering, it's okay to smile, and we actually should encourage that. A for all together. A second child is never an easy decision, and if you can get the whole team involved from uh, services to the family, it will make it much easier for everybody. And ultimately, it's about being kindness, being kind. When I asked lots of families, what's the one main thing that you want from healthcare professionals? That was it. The simple kindnesses mean so very, very much. They really do. That's my baby now. He's now 19 and doing photography. Um, and I have to say, by the way, his peer, Andrew, took that photograph. I can't just, you can't just pinch photographs, mum, you know. Um, but I have to say, thank you. Because without people like you, people like me wouldn't be bringing beautiful babies into this world. And when I look back to that night, when, a few months after he was born, that I won't walk about, I thank God that I found a church doorstep and they found me. Had geography been different, I might have been one of those headlines where you read, Mum found in pieces on a railway line. They didn't. I'm here, and I will continue to be here. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, as I say, for all that you do. And let's all continue to work together so that more mums can experience the delight of having a new baby. And let me just finish with that from someone else. Children can and do bring a lifetime of happiness. Let's continue to let them do that. Thank you. Yeah, maybe have we got one question? Let's say I will be by reception the rest of this afternoon if you have got any other questions as well. I will sign books as well today if you want them. Thank you.